sorry, it's Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 to 16, and they'll appear on the screens. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and so has become plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock but cared for themselves rather than for my flock, Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land, I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and, and there they will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and make them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the sleep and the strong. I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Also props. Um, really good to see you all. And thank you for reading. And uh, thank you for the worship. That's really good. And it's really good to be together, isn't it? It's nice to see you all and uh, nicely spread out and nicely full. Um, we're continuing with our uh, series on, on uh, a new heart. And in these verses, it's, it's contained the heart of, of, uh, of God in, in the most powerful way in the Old Testament. It's absolutely wonderful how it captures it. And just, just as we start, uh, there's lots of talk about shepherd and sheep. And of course, it isn't about shepherd and sheeps. It's about leaders, it's about kings and their subjects. And the, the shepherd is a picture of leaders and uh, especially relating to Israel. And in verse 23 of the same chapter, it just clarifies that a little bit more. And it tells us that uh, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them and he will tend them with, uh, attend them and be their shepherd. You know, this, this prophecy was 600 years roughly before Jesus came. And you know, we hear those words and we take them just to say, okay, just 600 years. And we don't realize how powerful that is, that truth of that. Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that are contained in the Bible and loads in Ezekiel 
and all of them have come to so far. There's others that still are, are, are to come to, even within Ezekiel, but things have. I was just reading this book, and I just want to read you a couple of quotes which I found interesting of people that have made things and dreamt and uh, said things about their own inventions and see what they've thought. It's an idle dream to imagine that, the, that automobiles, cars in other words, will take the place of railways in long distant movement of passengers. This is 1913, the Third American Road Congress. Okay. Um, I think there is a world market for about five computers. Tom, this is Thomas Watson, IBM chairman. He said this in 1943. So we, some of us have got five computers each. Um, and these are men who were doing these things and their own things that had no idea what, how the world would be. And these were men who God inspired to speak. And the truth they spoke has come the things they spoke have become true uh, over the centuries, and some of them didn't see it in their own lifetime. Many did, but some of them didn't. And the kings uh, or were to be the shepherds of their people. And when you view a king or any position of leadership like that, it reshapes our perception of what a proper exercise of power should be. For one thing, it rules out the exercise of power for its own sake. And it demands that we support and nurture the flock. You may recall Jesus saying to his disciples when they were fighting about position in his kingdom, Jesus said to them, he pulled them together, and he said, you know that the rulers the, of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. So that's God's heart for leadership. That's how he saw the shepherds of, uh, of Israel, but also shepherds generally. Uh, very often, uh, we like, as those who speak, to have uh, alliteration and three points. So I've got three points, and my first point, like last week, starts with P. And this is the problem, okay? The shepherds are supposed to look out for their sheep, and the kings were supposed to do that in the time of Ezekiel. And they were looked to, should have looked after their subject. But through the prophet Ezekiel, God makes it absolutely clear in no uncertain terms that the kings were not doing this. Instead of caring for the weak, caring for the sick, the injured, the strayed, the lost, the kings were mostly just looking after themselves. They were feeding the, themselves, they were misleading and fleecing the subjects and just feathering their own nests. Ezekiel says, like parasites, you eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with the wool, and you slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. As a result, Ezekiel says, the sheep are now scattered on the face of the earth. They'd been, the, the Israelites had been exiled and there's no one to search for them. You know, if you look at the, the track record of the kings that, that were of Israel and of Judah, only three really stand out as being good. That was David, a guy called Hezekiah, another guy called Josiah. And about another eight or nine did okay, but the rest were pretty rotten, and some were outright evil. And so instead of helping their citizens, they were harsh and they were brutal. Uh, their hearts were just full of self-interest, looking out only for their own good. Does that sound familiar? When you look around the world today, those in leadership, think about the countries of the world. I'll start with my own country of origin, India. Uh, isn't it, doesn't it make you cry seeing those pictures? Where were the leaders? Why weren't they doing something? Why weren't they preparing? Why weren't see the rest of the world? What's happening? Why weren't they doing something? You look at Yemen, you look at Syria, you look at Russia, you look at China, and it's, it breaks your heart when you look at these places. You know, when you, when you think about all that, it's quite good to point the ping, finger, but you bring it home. You know, look at our leaders. You know, they do some good, but you look at their lives. You know, this, all this Lee stuff that's going on, the MP scandals over these recent years, the CEOs of, co of companies fleecing their own profits, the bankers, 
And sadly, and really sadly, even church leaders. You know, and at every level of leadership, God expects a shepherd heart. That's his heart. That's a heart he wants us to have. And when you look at it like that, who can really stand up to that challenge? You know, none of us. I'm not standing here pointing the finger at anyone. And I look at myself and I know the number of times I fail. The number of times I don't live up to anything that is described in these verses of God's heart for a shepherd heart. And as a result of the, the action of these leaders and these kings, Ezekiel lived in a time of deep distress among the Jews. At the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, uh, um, some of them, including Ezekiel, had been exiled to, to Babylon, uh, which is modern-day Iraq. And the Jews that, were, that remained in Jerusalem would rise up for one last rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar, their king. And by chapter 33, which is around 586, the city of Jerusalem and the temple had been destroyed. Most of the remaining population had joined the Jews in Babylon, and there's a huge number that were also killed. You know, when disaster strikes, don't we all ask why? You know, why me? Why us? Uh, and the Jews were thinking the same. They were no different. They're saying, God, you've chosen Jerusalem as your dwelling place. You know, the temple is yours. It's been desecrated. How can that happen? Could God abandon them? The people had presumed upon God being their God and not listened to what he had asked them to say, to do. The people of Israel, the people of Judah had been faithful, unfaithful for a long time. God has sent countless uh, prophets over the centuries to tell them, repent. And we heard a, a sermon last week on repentance. You know, God is passionate about mercy. He wants to be merciful. He has no joy in hurting anyone or condemning anyone. But they didn't heed. They didn't heed. So the next P, as a result of that, the penalty, this is what he says in verse 10. But now the Lord says, I am against you, the shepherds, and will hold you accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. That's verse 10. You know, God is slow to anger, but he does get angry. There's a limit to how much he'll allow, even today. You know, he, he wants us to turn and come to him. He will remind us. He'll ask us. He'll challenge us. He'll want us to come. If we don't, God will act. And we see this in, in, the, in the lives of the Jews over and over, over again in the Old Testament. He will act. The third P, the promise. You know, God never abandons his own. Once we're his, we're his forever. Ezekiel 34, 11 to 16 are some of the most beautiful verses in the Old Testament and maybe anywhere in the Bible. And I just want to highlight some of the things that, that come out from those verses. It says, I, look, I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them. I will bring them out from the nations and other countries. I'll bring them into their own land. I will tend them in a good pasture. I will tend my sheep and make them lie down. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Now this is a, a wonderful language of promise, wonderful language of hope, of salvation. It's a language of God's love for us, his heart for us. And we wonder how can this all happen? If you just go back to that verse 23 again, and it says this, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. God had someone in mind, someone that the heart was reflected in David, one of their great kings in the past, even before this exile in Ezekiel that we find. And God, God is going to bring something new about. 
And we know when we think of those, those, those verses that it's talking about Jesus, someone coming through. And he says in verse 27, they will know that I am the Lord. And in verse 31, you are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. When Jesus appeared on the scene, he used this metaphor for himself. He said, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. You know, we've got, we didn't put it in, but we have one image in the church behind me, of the good shepherd. It's a lovely, lovely image. Uh, and it's probably one of the most famous of what Jesus is like. He's a good shepherd. He's got lambs in his hand. And it's a picture of security, of love, and of compassion. Uh, you can have a look at the same glass. I don't know where you can see it on the, when you watch, if you're watching. Uh, but, you know, just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. And the amazing truth is that uh, Jesus died for us. He came to die. It says the good shepherd how can we tell he's good? Because he didn't come to fleece us. He didn't come to take things away, but he came to lay down his life for us. John 10, 11 says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus laid down his life, and this is what we just celebrated. And he died, he rose again, and he's alive today. And the false teachers and prophets had no commitment to the flock. Jesus wasn't doing a job he loved his, he, lo he came because he loved us. And he came to bring us back to himself. And, you know, when we, when we just go back to those verses that we, that we read uh, from Ezekiel, and we see how Jesus fulfilled the things that, that God spoke about through Ezekiel, he said, I will look after my sheep. It's the screen six that we looked at. I will rescue them. I'll bring them out of the nations and of other countries. You know, we sat here this morning from many different countries, praise God. Uh, Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. Can you hear his voice? Thank God that we've heard his voice. He's called us. You know, whether we are from Malaysia, you know, whether we're from India, whether we're from Pakistan, whether we're from the Philippines, wherever we're from, whether we're from Iran, whether we're from England, He's called us together. He said, I will bring them in, into their own land. I will tend them in good pasture. You know, can you hear Jesus saying, anyone who's hungry, come, come after me? You know, he fed them physically, feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000 and so on, uh, the miracles that he did. But he says, the food I will give you means that you will never be hungry again. If you're thirsty, come, on, come to me, he said. He said, I myself will tend my sheep and make them lie down. A sheep lies down when it's full, when it's had its fill. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. Can you think of that little man, Ezekiel? He's probably shorter than even I am. But Jesus said, come on down. He said, I want to, I want to, I want to eat at your place. He was totally lost. The Jews hated him, the Romans hated him. He was totally lost. But Jesus said, I want to, I want to come to your place. And he repents. I will bring back the strays. I will bind the injured and strengthen the weak. Do you feel weak this morning? Do you feel injured? The world has injured many of us this year, especially in many ways. Life injures people, but the good shepherd says, come on, come to me. I will bring healing. I know, I know that many are suffering in different ways this morning, but our God is a God of love and of justice. The, he says, I will shepherd the flock with justice. You know, we, we can cry out to God when things go wrong. You know, why me? If we've done things wrong, there is, things will happen. You know, if, we, if we've neglected God's call time and time again and not responded, we will suffer. But God doesn't want that. He wants us to come to him. His heart is for, for justice, but his heart is for love. You know, these, these verses are, uh, as I said, a promise and of hope. If you never turn to the Lord and you want to this morning, you, the Lord's arms are open wide. He says, come. If you've come already and you've strayed, he says, come back. There's nothing we can do to earn that salvation, but he says, come back. I want you, I love you. And if we do that, he will welcome us. He will heal our injuries. 
He will strengthen us where we are weak and he will fill us in ways that only he can. If you've never done, taken that step and you want to take that step, do come and talk to me afterwards of, of, and I will, we'll pray and we'll commit our lives to the Lord. If you want prayer, there'll be a prayer team as well that uh, will pray and uh, we can ask them, I can ask them to pray for whatever you want prayer for. And God is in the uh, business of healing. He's in the business of bringing, making us whole. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you this morning that you're here with us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you that he is the good shepherd. He's the one who laid down his life for his sheep. Thank you that you've called us. Thank you that you tell us that you that your sheep hear your voice. Father, thank you that you speak to us in ways that, Lord, are personal to us. And Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that you laid down your life, that you rose again, that you're alive again, that you're interceding for your church, for your people, for your family, before God. Lord, without you, we have no rights. But it's only through you, the Good Shepherd, Lord, we can have any access to God. Thank you, Father. That's what Jesus came to do, give us access to the Father because we had made that relationship sour. And we thank you for him. And Father, I want to thank you for each one in this room. Lord, you know each one of our situations. And I pray in your name, Lord, that you will draw us closer to you this morning. Lord, that we may know you and, and walk with you. In Jesus' name.